Okay, so we're going to get going uh, with the uh, Forum A. So if you're looking for Canada research, that's in Forum B. Uh, but uh, we're really pleased to uh, have Angela and Jessica join us today. Uh, what we call this session is the Global Growth Showcase. And what we've tried to accomplish uh, over the last uh, seven or eight GELFs is we try to carve out a session where it's really targeted to brands that are relatively new to, to e-commerce. Now, just because the brands are relatively new to e-commerce, my two speakers are not relatively new to e-commerce. In fact, Jessica joined, a, what was it, five years or so ago? So she's like a vet of the, uh, the Gulf New York. And Angela, this is your first time joining us, so thank you. Angela's been a big patron of some of our dinners, so we've got all sorts of dinner talk that uh, I won't be able to get into up on stage, but uh, it's fun stuff. So uh, what I'd like to do is just let uh, Angela and Jessica introduce themselves. What we're going to talk a little bit about about is just, uh, you know, kind of how two different type brands are, you know, kind of launching their international. Um, Angela will talk a lot about all the product categories and SKUs, and Jessica will talk a little bit more about how seasonality works in the, uh, the swimwear world. So, Jessica, why don't you say a quick hello, and then we'll go over to you, Angela. Hi. Um, <clears throat> hi, everyone. Uh, Jessica, like Ken said, um, and VP of Growth at Andy Swim. Um, so my background is uh, I've spent about 10 years or so in digital marketing and e-commerce in both um, apparel and uh, and beauty. Um, and yeah, Andy Swim is on our global path uh, about two years in out of five. Great. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Angela Gruska. I'm SVP of digital marketing and e-commerce at Aaron. Um, I've been in the uh, luxury retail space for about 20 years now um, across different brands um, in fashion, such as Anne Klein. I spent about a decade at ABC Carpet and Home launching e-commerce um, and their digital transformation. Um, also spent time at Millie um, in contemporary fashion as well as Maria Tash and Fine Jewelry. And now I'm at Aaron um, leading e-commerce um, as well as digital transformation and uh, growth globally. Um, so when it comes to Aaron, um, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with the brand, but Aaron is a luxury lifestyle brand led by Aaron Lauder, who is the granddaughter of Estee Lauder. Um, our business is really built around the motto of um, living beautiful should be effortless. Um, and authenticity and uh, the Aaron lifestyle is really built into the core of the brand. Um, and as we're looking to the next chapter of Aaron, we're actually celebrating 10 years uh, this September. We're looking on expanding globally, uh, piggybacking off of some of the, the growth of our beauty business, which is in 46 markets worldwide, um, as well as our lighting business as well. So tell us a little bit about uh, your kind of international journey, what markets you guys are selling in. Uh, Jessica, I know some consumers can buy from the U.S. site and some of them buy from the Australian site. Yeah, so uh, there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's kind of two buckets, I guess. Um, so we're, we're U.S.-based, we're, we're New York-based, um, and we're in swimwear. It's the definitely the most seasonal uh, vertical I've ever worked in. So May, June, July are big peak months. Um, and actually, specifically to help offset that, um, we actually entered the Australian market, which, as I'm sure you can imagine, is actually really big. Um, like, swimwear is just very popular. So it just helps bring a little balance to, I mean, frankly, cash flow, but also, you know, like, <laughs> keeps us, keeps our uh, kind of workflow um, more consistent throughout the year, which there's something to say for that, too. So we um, were five and a half years old. We entered the Australian market. Um, this is our third peak season, so relatively early on, actually. Um, and because it's literally the other side of the world, um, we do have a local um, site and distribution center um, that also services, like if you're in New Zealand and Hong Kong, you can shop on that site as well. And then from the U.S. site, um, <clears throat> we so we actually did just um, we're on Shopify and we are now doing Shopify markets since um, like right soon after it, it rolled out actually kind of in I think May of this year, um, and we use that to be able to reach customers predominantly. Canada is really the the next biggest international market, but. Um, a number of other markets um, throughout the world can also shop the U.S. site uh, as well. Got it. And Angela, I know uh, you know the 
the kind of jaw dropper when we were first talking was like, well, 40% of our traffic's international, and yet you guys are new to international. Tell us a little bit about, you know, where you guys are targeting, where the traffic is coming from, and then dive into some complexity, you know, just so many different SKUs and so many different regulations, and how does that help frame it? We're, yeah, I don't want to jumpstart the whole importance of the business strategy because that's our next question, but tell us a little bit about the geographic uh, scope of what you guys are looking at doing. Yeah, so it's really interesting. I mean, I think looking at the makeup of our traffic, you would have thought that we would have expanded globally yesterday, um, and I think bringing me into the company, that was the thought as well. Um, but you know, the reality is that expanding globally is not easy. Um, and I wanna make sure that we start with a really strong foundation before we tackle new markets. Um, so we're in the midst of a replatform at this moment. Um, we're working with some complex systems and architecture right now. So I'm looking to build a more scalable, agile architecture to support global growth. Um, so that's the, the first priority. Um, in terms of that makeup of that 40%, a lot of that is driven by um, our beauty our beauty growth and, and because we're in so many different markets. What's so interesting is that we see the greatest penetration um, in Australia, Canada, um, in the UK, but we also see um, penetration across many different countries all over the world. So I think when we're thinking about expanding globally, we're thinking about being able to service customers all around the world, not just in our major markets. But I think when we're thinking about it from, you know, what is the first step? How do we tackle, you know, a new market? We're starting with our three core, which would be um, the UK, Australia, and, and Canada, really focus our marketing efforts there, but also offer um, a customer experience that would enable our customer to transact um, nowhere, no matter where they are around the world. Got it. So we were joking a little bit about the uh, fact that both of you guys are seasoned marketers, and, and Jessica was like, I'm VP of growth. I want, I want marketing in my title. So when you guys got your Series B was kind of when you came on, can you share a little bit about, you know, kind of, you know, a lot of times we see international really kind of being funded at a B or C or something like that. What were some of the first things that, you know, you really had to do as you got brought on to, to kind of lead this, this international push from a marketing perspective? <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, so as I said, Australia was kind of um, up and running like and had done um, done pretty well actually since the inception. We had, um, I, I know I'm jumping ahead too with this question, but we had someone local um, to help us with some of the <clears throat> some of the local marketing. We also had done um, a uh, Co, like co-designed product with Claire Holt, um, so a celebrity that was like really well known um, in the local market la the previous year. Um, so there had been some like bigger like s singular things that had been done, but um, I was brought on for to really like evolve the multi-channel strategy both in, in the U.S. and abroad. So um, a lot of what we've done. Uh, for both Australia and um, for other markets as well, we have the same kind of core um, core targets. Is uh, <clears throat> roll out uh, additional channels where where we kind of could easily using the resources we had, and by resources I mean team and budget. Um, what's been great is um, clearly there are many brands trying to do the same thing. So a lot of the vendors that we use also had been um, launching internationally. So we do use Attentive, um, and we this year have rolled out Canada, UK, and Australia for Attentive. I will say that SMS is going particularly well in Australia. We're capturing a lot of numbers, which is great. Um, and it's driving like a greater percentage of revenue, I think, than we had really anticipated off the bat. Um, what else? Clavio, email capture. Um, uh, there's probably more, but that was kind of step one is just there was a lot of priorities coming on board and how can we sort of seamlessly reach more of our international customers by just using kind of the, the resources that are already at our fingertips. And are you guys doing some TikTok, some of the live selling, some of the, the video <coughs> shorts and things like that? Because I know, uh, you know, we'll talk a lot about Asia and a lot of times we'll default to China, South Korea, Japan, but you know, Australia's part of that whole Apex mix and you know, certainly that's a big part of what you guys are uh, looking at there. Yeah, we do plenty on social, owned, earned, and paid. Um, and TikTok is something that uh, we're particularly excited about now. I'd, I had just in my kind of conversations and networking had heard, and so had our paid agency actually, that TikTok um, 
is actually quite popular in Australia um, and that a lot of, I think, brands were seeing success uh, maybe uh, maybe between the owned, earned, and paid of just being able to, um, to reach people cost-effectively uh, which is usually the case if, if something, the US market kind of takes over something and quickly the costs just become a little prohibitive seeming. Um, so that's one advantage um, I've found in, and it's true in this case of, of international markets, um, and TikTok is a great example. So we're currently, um, because it's it's their learn, going into their peak season, um, we've kind of pivoted the team's focus to um, in particular, we're doing a like a micro influencer focus on on TikTok, and we're finding that it's very affordable. Um, and because you know, with TikTok, you just have that chance for virality. It doesn't really matter um, even how big the influencer is in the first place. Um, so we're doing that for both earned, and then also um, we're collecting some content for our own channel as well to post. Because I'm sure, as many of you know, the content monster needs to be fed all the time, <laughs> um, and then paid as well. On TikTok. So real quick, um, you know, part of the reason I, I, I put that inflation chart in the opening comments was, was the conversation we had. Um, you know, so we've gone through the trade wars, we've gone through the pandemic, but it's really inflation that's hitting you guys. Are you guys seeing it differently? Because I know one of the charts I didn't show was actually I think inflation is a little bit less in Australia, but still hitting the business, right? Yeah, um, <clears throat> and that ties back to the comment too about just having the, the local on the ground person. It's just, um, it's and they're not a full-time employee, but it's literally someone that does helps with PR and organic social. But any like local partner that you have for any market, I, the conversation for me, like 25% of the like check-in is always like, what what's happening around you? Like, are brands on sale? Like, how, how do people like feel? What's the, I mean, of course you could, sort of read articles and probably all kinds of charts, but it's so helpful to have um, that kind of person that knows the brand to kind of just give you their two cents. Um, so it's exactly, as you said, um, it's not quite maybe as bad as here, but but it's it's definitely still impacting uh, impacting the market in Australia. Yeah, and I'm gonna jump to the total business strategy. So Angela like opened up with that, and I was like, oh, she's gotta get up on stage. But uh, real quick, you guys also, Sammy, you're, you're dealing with a higher end consumer, and I think some of that, you know, kind of went without saying earlier in the session. It's like, yeah, you know, some people are, you know, yep, inflation hurts, but it doesn't hurt them as much. Are you finding that uh, depressing any demand, or is the luxury shopper somewhat insulated from that? So I think what we're finding, I think we have an ultra, ultra high net worth affluent customers. So it's not necessarily, you know, the inflation isn't as much impacting our business, but I think it's more from a, a competition perspective. So what we're finding is that a lot of our wholesale partners are discounting very heavily which is then hurting the demand of our D2C business. Um, like everyone's on friends, friends and family this week. And like, we don't wanna train our customer um, to transact um, to sale. So, but now the world around us, everyone is on sale all the time. Our products are on sale all the time, which then impacts our demand. Um, and obviously, no matter how wealthy you are, um, when you go to you know Google Shopping and you see our product 40% off somewhere else, you're still going to buy it 40% off, unfortunately. So that is something that we are are dealing with right now, which is challenging. It's called smart money for. Reason, right? <laughs> uh, so again, tell us a little bit about how you guys, you know, the importance of this total business approach. Maybe explain kind of yeah. you know where you guys were coming at. And again, I think you made the right point. It's like 40% international. We should be doing this yesterday, yeah. but it's not that easy. It's not that easy. And it truly is a total business strategy. So you need to make sure that all of your cross-functional teams are supporting this initiative. Um, and we can really piggyback off some of the awareness that um, our other channels are driving. So um, from a wholesale perspective, we are distributed worldwide. Um, so we're really looking at you know, um, talking to our wholesale teams how they can open up new accounts in some of the key markets that we're looking to move into. Um, also from just like a, a marketing perspective, looking at developing uh, relationships with um, collaborators that may have more brand, brand awareness in specific markets. So for instance, we just did a collaboration with Tanner Kroll, who has um, a lot of brand awareness in, in the UK, but a very little brand awareness here in the US. So it's like, obviously the cost of acquisition is very high from a marketing perspective. So it's looking at how you can partner with your wholesale teams. Don't look at them as competition, but look at them 
how they can support your D2C strategy and create more brand awareness in these markets where you may not have as much brand awareness. Um, and we're doing the same thing, like I said, when it comes to you know collaborations, building more partnerships, looking at what is our our roadmap for you know 2023, 2024, 2024. What markets are we looking to tackle? What partnerships? You know, who has more brand awareness? How can we um, collaborate with these different brands in these markets to create more brand awareness of the Aaron brand? I think we're a bit unique in the sense that it's not just the Aaron brand, but it's it's Aaron the person. So she is a global influencer, but um, there are certain markets where I think she's a more powerful influencer than she is, you know, um, in other markets. So it's really making sure that we create um, more awareness and, and more demand in these new emerging markets. So we're really working cross-functionally with our teams and our partners to develop a unified business strategy for expanding globally from a DTC perspective. And again, feel free to jump in if you have any questions or anything like that. I, I did want to come back to uh, Aaron being the influencer, the the slightly older, um, you know, demographic that you guys serve. And, you know, influencers are different, you know, people. I have different influencers than, you know, uh, what was it, Little Gal or, or who was the one? Uh, that, Baby girl, excuse me. See, I don't know these things. Um, anyway, so yeah, tell us a little bit more about, you know, especially the, the fact that your social and your influencer is a little bit more catering to the B2B, the wholesale, the, you know, the, the people that help you guys sell products. Yes. So it's really interesting. Um, so our our core customer is in that, you know, uh, 55 to 65 year old age range, um, which is a much older uh, demographic. Um, so it's a little bit more challenging to partner with influencers um, to drive awareness and demand. Um, but where we do, we see a lot of opportunity is really from more of a trade perspective. So interior designers incorporating our Aaron products into their homes. Um, that's where we really see the value. So it's a, it's a different type of influencer. So that like, you know, obviously looks at, you know, our total business strategy as it relates to growing our trade relationships and our trade programs and creating a more seamless trade experience online, more, uh, you know, partnerships and events as it relates to the trade community, getting more uh, building stronger relationships with trade. And, and now the way, what's happened is that these interior designers are very active on social media and that's how they're gaining new clientele. So um, it's really getting our products in more consumers' homes and developing these real strong relationships with our trade partners. Um, I think also, um, you know, from a sort of next generation perspective, um, our beauty team has done an excellent job in terms of partnering with influencers uh, worldwide. Um, so we are gaining brand awareness um, from a beauty perspective with a younger demographic. But um, what we're seeing is that that customer is not necessarily, they have not graduated yet to like the complete era and lifestyle. So I think for us right now, it's really focusing on, you know, trade and, and, and very, a very unique caliber of influencers. So for the next session, we will be focusing a lot on smaller D2C brands and things like that. Um, Given the complexity of the catalog and you know different ways to plug lighting products in, and uh, any advice for um, someone that is multi-category? I mean, is it a subset of the catalog that you go market by market with? What are the testing? What, what's all the thought that goes into you know how many products do we put where in the world? So I think the first thing is really partnering with a cross-border solution. When you have a very wide catalog um, that encompasses products across different categories, there's so many you know, shipping regulations and restrictions. It's impossible for any business to manage it on their own. Um, so I think it's first like starting with, instead of launching separate storefronts, it's really working with a cross-border solution um, to enable a more seamless customer experience. Um, and, and I think when it comes, and, and that will also enable you to, you know, cut out certain products that maybe can't ship, whether it be restrictions or in our case for lighting, you know, uh, our plugs only are, are, you know, compatible with, let's say, the UK and the US. So we wouldn't be able to offer, you know, our lighting products to sp specific markets if, like, the plugs don't work. So um, I think it's really about that technology. Um, and when we're really, I think when you're thinking about expanding globally, I always say it's like the three Ps. So it's like the platform, the people, and the process, and really getting those in place. Um, but I really think it starts with, like, that foundation and getting, 
uh, the technology in place, building a foundation. So in our case, we're replatforming to enable uh, the integration of this third party uh, cross-border solution. Um, and then from there, you can start to work with them as a partner to develop you know, the strategy of how you're going to roll out key categories to different markets. Got it, got it. Um, Jessica, kind of back to you know the importance of an in-market partner. Any advice for how to, I mean, did you guys get lucky? You know, how do you find the right person? And, you know, how do you prepare for that person to, you know, sorry, I got a job or, you know, I'm off on a passion project or something like that. What are some of the things that, you know, especially, you know, people maybe with a little bit less of a category, you know, challenge like Angela has, what should they think about as far as finding those partners? Um, I do think that <clears throat> our Australia partner may have come through like local referrals, which was great. I think um, our founder and CEO through her network um, was able to get in touch with this contact. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. Like if that's if that's not an option, um, I would say we we uh, similarly wanted basically a, a, the same type of contact for Canada, and I approached it actually like I I was I was actually really nervous to be able to find um, a great local partner. Obviously, when it's all the same language, that's one thing. As soon as you throw in another language, that's going to um, definitely make it a little bit more challenging. But um, I, I did a, a <clears throat> uh, just a regular agency search um, online and actually was able to vet and find like a, a great partner that way for Canada. OK, great. So um, one, and it, you know, we, we talked a lot about uh, different complexity, points of complexity, Angela. The one that you know, came up earlier today was this whole idea of all the pricing dynamics. And you know, so you've got lots of different SKUs, you know, potentially different markets. Uh, how are you guys looking uh, at pricing and pricing for different markets, especially acknowledging different inflation you know, as you guys start to, to, to go global? So I think it's a it's a mix of fixed and dynamic pricing. So we're already having those conversations now. I know our wholesale wholesale team is very concerned um, because obviously they they want to be competitive. They still want to be able to sell their goods as well. Um, so I think it's 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 a mix, um, and that's something that I think I would advise that you work on, you know, with your cross border solution. But um, I think you need to be relevant to the market that you're in and that's why you really need the technology to help support that um so whether that be even looking at like how duties and taxes are integrated at the pdp level or the checkout level whatever is most native to that market i think is is core because it will have an impact on on the con all, the overall conversion rate so uh, any more questions? We're going to wrap up here in about a minute or so, but I wanted to talk a little bit about your customer service, you know, because that was another thing we don't cover as much uh, at these events as we need to. And, I mean, a, a lot of, in fact, uh, Oscar will be talking later, and, and he started, uh, he was a customer service person. Now he runs ops for his brand. So uh, especially with that high net worth individual, customer service, obviously in the English-speaking languages, maybe we assume it's the same, but... You know, it's not always the same. Ex yeah, exactly. So I think this is this is a big part of the strategy as we're talking about expanding globally. Is what does that mean from a customer experience perspective, um, and making sure they have the appropriate resources in place to serve the customer. We have a very very like high touch. Um, needy customers. So we have customers to just call to talk about the products. That we have customers that call that literally have them like handhold them through the checkout process um, because our customer is older. They're highly affluent. They're not as digitally native, so they require a lot more support. So when we think about expanding internationally, this is so core to our strategy. So finding the right um, the right partner, um, outsourced customer service department that will enable us to. Um, you know, have that ability to connect with consumers um, in either their native language or understand how to best communicate to customers of, you know, where they are. Got it. Okay, uh, any questions before I ask you guys to give these guys a big round of applause? Key topic, the whole wholesale piece, we're going to tackle that. We go to a whole session in the afternoon where we're looking at this, this balance of D2C and working with wholesale partners. It's always been a big, fun topic. So thank you guys so much for joining us. I really appreciate it.